The Bank of England is not independent, but nor is the Treasury. Yeah. At the moment, they can get gilts off for reasonable prices. And now after the budget for a while, it'll look quite good. But uh, wait and see what happens if interest rates go up and the amount of money it's costing you and I eventually. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to this latest IEA In Conversation With series. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined for this episode by the Right Honourable Lord David Owen. Lord Owen, welcome. Uh, Lord Owen has been one of the most impactful politicians over decades. He was initially elected to Parliament in 1966 as a Labour MP. He went on to serve as Navy Minister, Health Minister, and one of our very youngest foreign secretaries in the Labour government up till 1979. In 1981, of course, he famously was one of the Gang of Four who broke away from the Labour Party to establish the SDP, the Social Democratic Party. Full disclosure on my part, uh, when I was a much younger man, I joined Dr Owen's SDP in 1987. Uh, when it split from the uh, alliance, I was particularly attracted at the time uh, the, of David Owen's approach of trying to get markets to deliver compassionate results in society. Really inspired me as a young person. Uh, the SDP folded in 1990, but Lord Owen's advice has been sought by politicians of all stripes uh, since then, and frequently his endorsement has been sought as well, but he has usually played his cards quite close to his chest, even though uh, many have tried to curry favour with him. Um, he wrote for us 40 years ago in our journal Economic Affairs to lay out the case for a compassionate capitalism. And we have just released 40 years on, almost exactly 40 years on, 39 and a half years on, a paper he's just written for us called Rebuilding Britain, Restoring Confidence, Competitiveness, and compassion. And both of these papers are linked in the show notes uh, below and available on the IEA website. Lord Owen, welcome. Pleasure, Pleasure. to have you here at the Institute nice of Economic here. Affairs. Um, let me start, I guess, by going back to the 1980s when you uh, wrote this uh, article, um, anticipating a general election in 1988. Of course, it came along in 1987 when you led the SDP then. I was a very young man then, but the 1980s seemed to me to be a rather optimistic, perhaps slightly chaotic, but buccaneering, market-orientated, let's go get them sort of gangbusters Britain. It was quite an exciting time to be alive and quite an optimistic time to be alive. Is that your recollection of the 80s? I think so, yes. Um, Margaret Thatcher was too successful for my liking. <laughs> But uh, she deserved her success up until probably the last year when she started to ignoring colleagues and treating the cabinet really famous uh, um, characterization of it that then, of course, was on... Um, Spitting image. Yes. We were all lampooned. You were all characterised on, on spitting, spitting image. image. Yes. But she, they got her. She was beginning to dictate to the cabinet, not listening to the cabinet. But she was a formidable prime minister. I was just coming from the House of Lords and two Greek people, and I was explaining the four main statues in the members' lobby. And really, amongst us Labour MPs and then the SDP, there was never any doubt that the pedestal which was left beside Clement Attlee, the two war leaders, was bound to be filled by her, and rightfully filled by her. She was a formidable person. So if you're going to be beaten by somebody politically, you might as well be beaten by, by a good one. Formidable. <laughs> formidable. Mm. And uh, the IEA and lots of think tanks were obviously involved in trying to assess and shift the, the, the climate of opinion. Uh, if you were to look back to the 1980s, do you think the climate of opinion then was fairly market-orientated? Um, I mean, of course, Lawson, you know, lowered marginal rates of tax. Uh, corporation tax was very high then, I guess, but there was a move towards a more deregulated uh, economy. 
I think Margaret Thatcher famously worked out on one occasion, if we keep going like this, we'll pay off the national debt in 27 years or some such like. There was a certain fiscal rectitude. It seems to be completely the opposite today. It's a more complicated world, and we better start to learn about this new world. Uh, so I'm not altogether sure how different it is. Um, Britain is still not earning its living. We're still tending to have a sliding currency. Um, I agree that there's not the same elan. I mean, I dared as this new leader of the Social Democratic Party to write this essay in the IEA. Mm -hmm. I knew it would shock people. I wanted to shock, shock people. people. Yep. I wanted them to wake up to the fact that we had forgotten for many years through the rather comfortable 50s, 60s, and 70s. But it's a truism, but it's worth repeating. The world doesn't owe you your standard of living. And if you choose to live at a much higher standard of living than you are earning, there's trouble ahead. Mm -hmm. And it has been a besetting sin of this country that we have not been able, except in fairly short periods of time, not much longer than five or six years, the Lawson uh, Thatcher period was a successful period. There's no question about that. But you had one big thing to unleash, you know, the city. And you, they did it with their land and with speed. And it was, a, but we didn't hold that. And I think the answers for that are what we'll be discussing, and they're complex. Do you think we're now back into the sort of malaise of the 1970s? I mean, if you... You mentioned that the world doesn't owe us a living. I think I'm right in saying that the last time a government of any stripe ran a budget surplus was 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, taxes as a total proportion of GDP, I think, are now at their highest rate since the post-war Attlee government. Uh, barely a day goes past without the state wanting to regulate something more, some other part of the, mm -hmm. the private sector. Growth has been disappointing. And we just sort of seem to be back in what I suppose Margaret Thatcher would have criticised of the 1970s, a sort of period of managed decline. You don't sort of necessarily think anything's going to blow up, but it's just not going to improve very much. But people are very rich. And you have to ask yourself, is there something deeper than this? How are the rich funding the UK? They're not doing it through tax. They're very rich. The rich are lending money to the UK mm -hmm. and being repaid very handsomely in uh, uh, dividends, gilts that seem to endlessly go on getting money. And I think that uh, Robert Reich, the uh, US economist, wrote a piece in The Guardian, a few long piece, and he said, America is no longer being financed in the same way. Uh, the rich don't pay much tax in America, but they pay by lending to the government. That may be where we're going. I mean, if the conservatives uh, retain power or come back fairly soon, say only out for one session, uh, one parliamentary uh, period, it is maybe that that's how it will shift. And there are some signs of that. We've got huge debts. Now, I, I know there are a lot of people who made a living for years telling us how Keynes would have behaved, and the belief that somehow you can endlessly borrow is often attributed to Keynes. I think it's complete nonsense. I don't believe he would ever have accepted, but I don't like interpreting what Keynes would do. He's a great figure and a huge influence on economics. And here I must give you a rider. I mean, I came into the House of Commons knowing no economics. And then I listened as Jim Callaghan was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, steady as she goes, then further cuts in public expenditure, another steady as she goes, another. And I thought to myself, I have got to understand economics. And I'm self-taught. I had a very wide range of tutors in um, my economics, so... I don't claim to be an expert, and I may well have got some things wrong in this pamphlet. I hope not. But um, I think I'm fairly good at looking at trends. I, you know, I'm a, 
a doctor from the neck up. I, I even, the only surgery I ever did was on eyes. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't get away with that now. And I've been a neurologist and a neuroscientist. And I'm quite used to dealing with problems which you don't know much about. You, you've got to try to get underneath. And I hope in a little small way, I've done this in this pamphlet, I'm not writing for the here and now of the budget. I am writing about a country that had almost the ultimate humiliation of having its Prime Minister and its Chancellor of Exchequer disowned internationally. I mean, the trust episode must not be forgotten by this country. To lose international confidence, we, have, we never did that even with the IMF. And to lose international confidence in that way is very serious. Once it's happened once, it's much easier for it to happen to twice. So we're in, in uh, some people would call them a safe pair of hands. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I would probably do them harm in, in terms of the IEA to say that Hunt and Sunak are a safe pair of hands. But they have certainly, on the face of it, restored confidence, put it that way. But it's only on the face of it. If the underlying problem is still there, this could happen to us again. So you mentioned this pamphlet throughout that you consider the UK's global economic position to be fragile, perhaps, vulnerable. Absolutely. And I guess from an IA perspective, uh, I would suggest that this is a culmination, irrespective of the 49 days of Elizabeth Truss, of continually living beyond our means, continually running deficits. Uh, you're highly critical, which I want to come to, at the huge levels of QE and the long-term behaviour of the Bank of England and the Treasury. Whether you think, you know, Liz Truss lost the UK credibility on the international stage, and I can see a good case could be put for that, we are inevitably building up to these sort of crises if we don't change trajectory, aren't we? You cannot just run these deficits forever. I would hazard a guess that Keynes would have said his philosophy was run surpluses in the good times in order you can run deficits in the bad times. We seem to run modest deficits in the good times and colossal deficits in the bad times, not Keynesianism at all, really. Yes, so something has to be done. I believe that motivation is a very complicated issue. And I think that my long-standing criticism of the IEA is that you have attracted yourself to a almost a philosophy that the entrepreneur needs tax incentives to plough their furrow, if you like. I think it's a huge exaggeration. And I have written an awful lot about motivation in people, but not largely illness and heads of government, but underneath illness and heads of government, I've looked at what drives people and what is the underlying neurology and neuroscience of hubris and everything like that. And I've, I've looked at this into a huge amount of business people. I have been also in some very entrepreneurial businesses. I mean, apart from doing business in Russia in the wild days, I was also in the pharmaceutical industry in the United States and the oil industry in the United States. These are very entrepreneurial things. I am not convinced. I think the aspiration to succeed and to be respected and honored is considerable amongst hardworking entrepreneurs. And to take risks for it is very considerable. If I had to look at the tax system for them, it's not so much uh, the actual rate of income tax. Of course, it's always a factor. I think they want to feel that there's an atmosphere where they can go bankrupt and still be respected in society. It's not the end of the bloody world. And they can come back. And this is a very big difference from America. I mean, I say, that's a very American trait. Yeah, Here, you're I, struck I'm, off forever, right? I'm married to, to an American. American and also a highly successful literary agent who made at one various times with various authors a lot of money. Jeffrey Archer was one of her 
authors once used to boast when the SDP was started that I'm funding the SDP. <laughs> he didn't realize how close it, it was, was to, to the, the truth. Mark. Right. So she, and I, absolutely, it is the distinctive feature. There is no real uh, slur or lack of confidence in you if you fail in American business. Unless you hands in the till, or yeah, yeah, like initial that. corrupt, yeah. yeah. But if you have had a go and you failed, uh, people come back uh, for more money, and they by and large get it. And there is a feeling almost good on you mm -hmm. for at least the first or second time, maybe third or fourth time going bankrupt. I think we have to change that attitude, and I think that's much more important. And I think that. Prestige of business matters too. I don't think we give anywhere near enough um, social standing, mm. respect. We don't teach in schools, particularly 16 plus, about entrepreneurship, why it has to exist, why it is an engine, a motivating force for the people who are doing it, motivating force for the people they build it in, and why it's a hugely attractive for a young person who's got ideas. And I don't think we do enough on that. Uh, the honours list, well, the honours list, quite frankly, has just become such a sick joke. It doesn't really work very much longer. But it, it is more um, cultural, respecting the views of people who are in entrepreneurial business in, by the broad left. I don't think they have much respect for it. And I think we've got to change that. And I think that for a Labour government, they try hard and they want to appear entrepreneurial and rewarding, but not very successful record of it. And I, I mean, at least the Wilson uh, Callaghan government had people like the Harold Lever, for mm -hmm, example. Mm -hmm. He was influential. Mm -hmm. He was admired. He was liked. He had a position in the cabinet with no real portfolio of government. But he he was listened to. And both Wilson and Callaghan listened to him. Chancellor's Exchequer had to listen to him. He had an unconventional way of looking at running the economy. And quite frequently he was co proven correct, but was not influential enough, you could say. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what I would be in inclined to look at. I, I think but, you've got too many theoreticians who've never actually taken a risk in their life telling us that you have to reward risk. Let me try and well, let me try and run the traditional IEA flag up the flagpole and see if anybody's You're perfectly says, entitled but, to do um, so. You, you might take the view, and I, I don't want to take a kind of Marxist determinist point of view that there's just an exact correlation between the tax rate and the level of welfareism and the amount of money printing and the amount of entrepreneurs in society. I would agree with you, and I want to come on to the cultural point shortly. But I suppose a broad IEA view would be, well, let's say, look at the UK economy, indeed the West as a whole, since the 2008 global financial crisis. And what you typically see is a growing state sector, a higher tax burden, a higher regulatory burden, and guess what? Whatever, whether there's causation or not, this is correlated with disappointing low growth rates. Oh, yeah, but you said regulatory. I completely agree with you on that. I'm a, ha a hard hawk on it, and it's one of the reasons many, many cited in my case, because I was a serious European, uh, a Brexiteer. Mm -hmm. oh, I have absolutely no doubt that the regulatory climate, again, in comparison with America, is markedly different. Mm -hmm. As I say, I've been involved in business now ever since I finished my hard labour, my sentence of hard labour, which was to be in the Balkans for two and a half bloody yeah. years. And ever since then, I've been... Actually, people don't realise it, but when we lost the 1970 election, I went into one of the most highly entrepreneurial businesses you could have, run by a person who was Professor of Marketing at MIT, and his own personal business, uh, international uh, decision-making models. And I, so for two years, I was working on the interface of change, technical change and that sort of thing. And I learned one hell of a lot. So I, I, I have to not so much admit, I kept it quiet. 
because people wouldn't take me seriously. Mm-hmm. But actually, when you lose an election, and I'd started by being interested in trying to modernise the Royal Naval Dockyards when I was Minister of the Navy. I'm actually genuinely interested in business. And um, so I, I, I think you've got to be clear. So I concede to you totally on your list, regulatory powers. Absolutely. And this is why Lawson is such a crucial figure in British history. He was more, of course, it helped to have Margaret Thatcher, but he knew how to do it. And I remember reading The Spectator when I was a young doctor, when he was there arguing for devaluation. There were three of us who openly argued for devaluation in a socialist commentary article in 1967. We weren't popular (laughs) with anybody but we openly call for devaluation. And that's another thing. Of course, that's now changed, but that held us back for years, the sort of sanctity of the pound and the value of the pound being equivalent to the Union Jack and all that Mm -hmm. sort of crap. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've got to live with the world. That's all improved. I I just think if you... Why I wanted to write for you, uh, I did ask to write this article for you, and you did kindly let me talk about compassion and uh, competitiveness can easily run together and in my experience frequently do and the facts of the matter are we again don't have anywhere near the philanthropy in the British system and Margaret Thatcher was always on about that and we need to encourage that so I, I think your range of issues don't to be taken in by trust. Uh, the trust has made a complete and absolute farce of being prime minister. Very, very damaging period. This is not the route the IAEA should go down. Regulatory, yes. Mm-hmm. Changing the climate to entrepreneurial, yes. Having people able to go bankrupt even, provided they don't take too many people with them, uh, is an essential element of a market economy. And there are many other things too with it. And I think that design and eye for detail, and you know, Dyson is a very interesting figure because people don't quite like what he's saying these days. I, I always read what he says. I mean, he's difficult. Well, who wasn't? Uh, but he. Well, many entrepreneurs often are fairly difficult. Well, fact. people there are occasionally. The odd person has said that I'm a bit. Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> of course, nonsense. <laughs> Just, I, I'm interested in this culture of entrepreneurialism as well. And I'm, as I say, I'm not so deterministic that I believe that the precise rules or the exact tax rate, you know, feeds straight through to the culture. But it does seem to be on regulation we've become a kind of nation of compliers rather than producers. And that's a sort of burdensome on somebody who wants to achieve something. And culturally, I don't know if it's attached to this or separate, but there's a sort of, and this is a rather broad brush observation, I suppose, but a sort of view that's sort of, if you've made a big profit, you're probably up to no good. Yeah. And if you've made a lot of money, you're probably up to no good. If you were to compare how sort of British, how British business news is covered on the television compared to American business, you know, yeah. big profits here are considered to be a sign that probably something's gone awry here. Who are these guys ripping us off? In the United States of America, it would typically be a cause of celebration, putting aside monopoly profits. But wh- why have we got that grim culture? Well, I here? don't like this profit tax. I mean, what the hell is a business person in business to do other than make profits? You know, I mean, it's one of the central tasks mm-hmm. that they have. And I think to chop on profits, what you do is put pressure on them. Now, this government did do this. I mean, BP, I have a quote in your uh, paper. You allowed me to have it in, rather boring in some ways. And I said, I'm not in favour of it. And then I quote what BP has done. Mm-hmm. So, now, they did, couldn't tell her, while well, everybody was sharpening their knives on their profit, they couldn't tell them what they were going to do. But I, it's worth reading that little paragraph in the, of what BP had actually done. Colossal Entry, reinvestment. It, colossal investment, all of it overseas, quite a number of it in countries rather poor, mm-hmm. and all on the environment and what to do with new cheap energy sources. Now, it's exactly what you want. So when uh, the cry goes up for taxing um, profits, I, I count me out, more or less, completely. I, I mean, if you're in an absolute crisis and the economy is, you know, when it was in a very difficult situation, there was just about a case to go for it. But the trouble is it breeds bad habits. Mm. Once you think the profits are taxable, 
Um, it's just easy money for people, but actually it's a nail in the coffin of the overall economy. So long term, you'd like to abolish corporation tax altogether, would you? Just not have that as part of the mix of the tax burden. I mean, uh, I don't think I'd be going down that. Thing. I don't think corporation tax is necessarily the most effective way of taking money from industry. Uh, but I, as I say, I've not had to pay an awful lot of corporation tax in my time. I've had to sit there watching American business assess how uh, what what contains investment. I think I prefer to change the subject into another issue, and that is the whole question of whether you need an industrial strategy. Now, probably the best thing to do is change the wording, and maybe that we're on to that now with uh, a, a great emphasis on modern technology and using innovation. Innovation is the inward. Okay, let's live with that. You've got to do something about the fact that we live in an un uncouth world. Now, I don't. I have to disguise this, but I lived a situation where there was a plant in this country that had been here since 1920. There had never been a strike. Highly efficient, excellent, but we needed to build another. And we thought, why not build on land which we had? We eventually were unable to build that plant because of grotesque cheating by an EU country. Mm -hmm. And so when I came to a regulatory, I'm tough on this. And I think we've got to face up to the fact that governments are lied to. On this particular investment... And which, which was it? Which, I, well, no, you're you. not... You won't give us the but full But I details. did go to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The ch I was given a proper hearing, and uh, I revealed a lot of what was going on, and it was not news to them. I didn't think it would be. And they have to bite on the bullet and accept it. So I believe there's a chance for a completely different concept of an industrial strategy now that we are out of uh, the EU and uh, we should expose uh, the uh, outrageous performance of some of these companies and we shouldn't feel inhibited. He felt it, the Chancellor felt it was not possible to reveal it. I couldn't tell them quite how awful uh, and this regime has changed two or three times. Eventually, there was absolutely no way we could reward loyalty and, and long service. Um, it just the difference of, it was not minor, it was major. That means it's crooked. Now, you were saying that you, your attraction, because of course one of the issues upon which you left the Labour Party on in 1981 was its hostility to the then common market, it was, mm -hmm. as it was called. But when we get to the Brexit, Referendum. You're saying one of your um, principal motivations for being on the Leave side was to escape the regulatory stranglehold. Are you disappointed with how little we've done with these newfound freedoms? I mean, if well, you can, industrial strategy is obviously that's something that's almost allergic to IEA folk, but we haven't liberalised financial services. If you're looking at exactly, new technologies, exactly. we're we're probably going to regulate the internet more than any other Western country. What are we doing to liber liberalise in the biotech field? I mean, we shout the slogan, but the public policy doesn't seem to follow from it logically. I, I agree, and I focus in this paper on the biochemistry and the mm -hmm. biochemical because it's what I know. But when I was Minister of Health in the good old days of the Department of Stealth and total obscurity, I had, I controlled the uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. side of the pharmaceutical industry, and I was encouraged to do so. But what was the first thing I did, for, inherited from Keith Joseph, was a man who had formerly been the head of Burns and Wellcome, and he was my advisor on the whole of this area. And you, if you take a narrow treasury view, you just screw the pharmaceutical industry so as to cut the bill to the pharmaceutical industry in the UK. And that we're, the government doing that now. Yep. We're talking about innovation, but screwing serious parts of the pharmaceutical industry. And well, you mentioned AstraZeneca in the paper. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, AstraZeneca was, was uh, also GSK. I mean, mm -hmm. both, uh, uh, building plants outside. Yep. 
you have got to take a short-term view out of this whole industry of high-tech. Uh, and your, your returns are much quicker as well. So you've got to take risks. So I believe that the, um, and I, I write it in the paper, this uh, new young uh, female politician, I don't mind her being young, and I don't even mind her being inexperienced. What I hope is she's got an open mind, but more important, access. So if the NHS starts screwing the pharmaceutical industry, she can take it out of the Treasury to the Cabinet. We're talking about Michelle Donnan here. In yes, the new, I don't yeah. know anything about yeah. her at all. I wish but her luck. wishing her well. Yes, yeah. good. I was appointed when I was very young, and I've got nothing against that. I'm all in favour of it, and she'll be all the better probably in 20 years' time. But the basic facts of the matter are you are not allowing the dead hand of the Treasury to destroy as much enterprise and energy and ideas as they do. And so in the pamphlet, I also, apart from dealing with QE, quantitative easing, I deal with the um, PFI. Mm -hmm. And this has... I mean, somebody must have been crazy in the Treasury to embark on this without spelling out what are the consequences. The consequences of going our way from treasury loans to build NHS hospitals, to put them out into the market and put them out into a quite selective market so they couldn't get even quote lower, you knew they were all going to quote very high, has been to make cost of building hospitals very much greater than yeah. it was. Well, what do the people who run the hospitals, you've given them independence, they trust, but they really are not really... Uh, leave that one. They look at it. They look at these things like make them hotel bills. So they boast about having ninety eight percent occupancy. occupancy. Yeah. And we have, and then you build less hospital beds. Now, I mean, it's just recently now the Sunak government has increased investment in hospital beds. We used to have about 75% bed occupancy. That was a pandemic safeguard. Yeah, yeah. It all went out through the we window without any discussion. Yeah. They were warned on the Cygnus report about the pandemic one. Where were they doing? Yeah. What were they doing in this time? They had three years warning of COVID. Uh, I want to come on to uh, healthcare because you, a, a large chunk of your pamphlet is about that. But before I do, institutionally, you give a pretty withering assessment of the Treasury and the Bank of England over the longer term. You mention in the paper that you think, you know, too often they get written up as having ridden to the rescue mm -hmm. where, without an analysis of whether they're actually having a sort of step-by-step, drip-by-drip. That's um, Aaron Davis's uh, actual and, uh, yep. diagnosis. I agree totally with it, and I quote it. Yes, no, I think this has been the history of it, and we need to be... Uh, how do we deal with it? I, I think... At the average Joe, when they read about how they, between the Bank of England and the Treasury, run the gilt market mm -hmm. and actually have a single fund and which the Bank of England can't lose and the Treasury collects the, well, the, the failures, I think they, people would be staggered. When they look at the cost, you know, over 800 billion mm -hmm. quid mm -hmm. are going through gilt markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you manage this gilt market? This was a bet they took when interests were low. If interest rates are going up, which I personally think they are, and they've already gone up since I sort of wrote that pamphlet, I think they're going to get uh, up, up a high. You are putting a hell of a cost. And people don't understand it. That's what I worry about. I mean, I... You know, I've tried to talk to some really quite good economists about it. They don't go into the nitty-gritty of how the Bank of England and the Treasury... The Bank of England is not independent, but nor is the Treasury. Yeah. And you've got an amalgam of these two, uh, which at the moment they can get gilts off at reasonable prices. And now after the budget, for a while, it'll look quite good. But, ah, oh, wait wait and see what happens if interest rates go up and the amount of money it's costing you and I eventually. And what was your remedy? What institutional reform would you like to see here? Should we, I don't know, fully renationalise the Bank of England? Does the Treasury need 
its wings clipped, more power to number 10, or is all this just... Well, look, when you, you've just had a withdrawal of international confidence, so we aren't going to do, uh, change the Bank of England or get rid of the governors or the chairman of the Bank of England. Uh, we've had now a new uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. So I'm not in favour of people changes. I'm afraid of, in favour of attitudinal changes. And Callaghan introduced this seminar which was a way of having a former Chancellor of the Exchequer having some lean on what was said. So the Governor of the Bank of England, the Deputy Governor came, the Chancellor, uh, I was asked as uh, Foreign Secretary to come. I would change my schedule abroad to come back to these meetings because it was the way I was learning. It was an influence. I would, if I was Sunak, I'd reintroduce that so that I mean, I think things are good between him and the Chancellor at the moment, but the t sods law are, there'll be differences. And have it in a forum which it can be discussed with the Bank of England, <coughs> I think would be a very good thing. The precedent is there. Callaghan, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Tories have got different views to me of what the Callaghan government was, but Callaghan, I think, handled the IMF very well. He understood international confidence. I watched then Tony Crossan, who I was much more attracted to in economic liberalism, if you like. But he couldn't face up to the fact that at the end of the day, there was no way we could reject the IMF terms. Mm -hmm. uh, confidence is what's going on. And that's feel and touch and judgment. And to bring the Chancellor and the other energy ministry and other ministries with the Chancellor, particularly now you've got an experienced um, uh, Prime Minister who knows, who's got views on the economy. I, I would encourage him to reintroduce the Callaghan Seminar. It's quite a sort of slightly Germanic way of dealing with things, isn't it? A sort of consensus around the key institutions getting those around the table. I don't say that in a dismissive way. I'm just no, trying to work out... It didn't make decisions. Don't I? I don't believe it should be a decision-making body. I mean... I mean, I'm a believer that uh, leaders have to lead, and I believe you have to make changes, and you have to do things, and some people don't like it. Um, just one thing you said about why I left the Labour Party. Why I left the Labour Party is both very simple and complex. It is very simple on one thing. The Labour Party was infiltrated by the far left at a very serious level, and still is today. Mm -hmm. It has never been cleaned up. Never. Starmer has not cleaned it up. Uh, Blair did not clean it up. And there was only one combination that could clear it up. That was a f new force outside, which was social democratic, and going to challenge Labour in their seats for votes. We did that actually quite successfully, but not enough. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons was we got into bed with the Liberals. We were not Liberals. We were not set up to be Liberals. We were set up to transform the Labour Party, to bring it back to the party of Attlee and Bevin and take it out from the far left. They're still there. I mean, Corbyn was there. I knew exactly who Corbyn had been. Just before I, I'd been out in that his area of London and catcalled and shouted down and everything like that, I didn't have much problem of it in my own constituency. In Plymouth? No. In Plymouth is a, either Conservative or Labour. Tons of people will say, why weren't you Liberal? That's a death to be a Liberal in Plymouth. It's the home of working class Toryism. Mm -hmm. Dockyard cities are like that. And you do, that's how it votes. I could hold them at SDP and did right to the mm -hmm. very end. But I could never have held them as a Liberal. Well, you might reflect, we're going back to the 80s here, that the SDP may not have been electorally successful, or as I was watching earlier today in preparation for this, the TVI coverage in 1981 of the launch of the SDP, and uh, David Butler speculating that the party might win 500 seats in a general election or some such like, but it, it was an influence. Quite often parties that don't get power can shift the balance of the other parties, even if the two-party system is yeah, locked in. We have not been in vain, and let's take one big section of the electorate, women. Mm -hmm. Up until 87, there was no breakthrough for women. The 80s were dominated by the women playing a major role in the SDP. A major role. Mm -hmm. And they're all around in different jobs now, left or right. They've gone on many different ways. 
I won't embarrass anybody by mentioning it. I, I never worry. Go where you want to do, mm -hmm. as far as I was concerned. We failed because we didn't force. Now, we couldn't do it alone. You had to have people like Roy Hattersley fighting within the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. They were going to lose, but you had to have him there and others like and some serious trade union people. But we also needed a force on the outside. So the Labour Party is not yet uh, reformed. They're quite lying quiet. And they're very clever. I mean, Corbyn and um, his chief aide, um, when I looked at the manifesto after Theresa May disastrously called that election, you, uh, terrible mistake. I mean, she was finished and the Tory party were finished after that. Never necessary. But I, look, I read this thing and they were in favour of the nuclear deterrent. Well, he'd never been in favour of the nuclear deterrent. None of them have been. They don't give a bugger. They'll lie to uh, blow in the face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, he's a very serious enemy. Please, me, we are not through with this problem. And they're not... You can push them aside and uh, like Tony, Tony Blair did very well, cleverly, and Mandelson, and now uh, Sama doing the same thing, and good luck to them. And uh, I think they've got new talent. I think Rachel Reeves is a very considerable talent in British politics. And I come back to women. They, they've never played the role. Inside the SDP, they were a major, major force. And I think that we had a profound effect on the Labour Party uh, my wife used to come to the Labour Party conference and she'd look around and they were all the oh, women. Mate. Right. Interesting. Interesting social change, not just a sort of political change that the SDP brought about. Now, you, you, a, a large part of your um, uh, research paper focuses on healthcare and the National Health Service, an institution of which you are, well, I suppose you're critical in terms of some of its results, but um, perhaps are unpersuaded of the... IEA's analysis on how to reform it. Do you? What is the IEA? Well, I swear, um, we don't take a we don't take a corporate position on any policy issue. But I can commend you, and we'll make sure we put it in the show notes. Universal health care without the NHS, written by our head of political economy here, Christian Nemitz, a German, who basically compares health outcomes mm -hmm. between the UK and and other European countries broadly on a social insurance model, mm. but a very marketised system. I mm -hmm. think I'm right in saying there's only, is there only one hospital in Germany now owned by the German government? Mm -hmm. Very marketised system, mm -hmm. or the reforms in the Dutch system in the 1990s, underwritten by the taxpayer. It's not a question of people going without insurance. Well, we have foundation hospitals. They're totally independent. Mm -hmm. They don't even serve a geographical area at the moment. But do you think that there is... I mean, what do you put the poor performance of the National Health Service down to compared to our European equivalents. And, well, I mean, in one word, Mr. Lansley. So you think it's the, the, the Lansley reforms that well, you're uh, very damning of, the 2012 reforms? Yeah. I, I'm only too pleased you say that. I hope so. But they've had no influence on it. Uh, I mean, let's face it, David Cameron has said quite plainly it was one of the biggest mistakes of his government. And it's still there. So ludicrous reform... Yet, you know, the thing is so fragile, I'm the last person to think you can go there. Well, I mean, first step I suggest is let Manchester under Burnham, Andy Burnham, and if he loses his election under any Tory who elected, um, run the hospital services, the GP services, the home caring services, the district nurses, all the whole thing. And I think you find it would be a great success. But it might not be. So don't do any more of these overall reorganizations. And <laughs> try it out. And I would trial it certainly there. And then, you know, we look at um, other changes in the health service of integrating with the, the social security structure. Tor Bay is one of the best integrated health and uh, hospital caring and the, very good. We've been way ahead for a long time. Now they might be given the charge of looking at Dilnot and the NHS and try and really weave the whole thing together. And they've got a lot of big area of retirement people. Uh, uh, there may be other ones, but I think that would be a conservative area. I so social care is not because the social care system's broken. That's putting much more 
pressure on the healthcare system. You're saying people yes. are effectively in hospitals because there's no easy way to release them. Into but the hospital, but the uh, the housing system is lousy. So you've got single people hanging on in their house, not wanting to change, not easy to change, not easy to downsize. There are all sorts of problems with the person who's managed to save a little bit, but who's fearing that they won't be able to cope for their full life if mm. they live to the right old late age. 90s, you know. And I think still not, everybody signs up to that without any understanding of cost. So I, I argue for a hypothecated health service. But the, you've got the worst of all worlds at the moment. You, you have these reforms, most of them were introduced by Labour, against Gordon Brown, against a lot of Labour MPs. This independent hospital stands there, and they've got that already. What's it? They're, they're too independent. They need to be integrated. So there are faults from the health service. Uh, uh, and I don't notice come first of all to say money, but the fact of life is that we've under invested in the NHS for 15 years or more, probably 20. Labour pretends that they've invested more, but <laughs> PFI has cost an arm and a leg. Yeah, you point out that can yeah. cost more than so 10% of the that, NHS trust budget. But in your European model, which is this is to be the policy of your IEA, be very careful. I mean, Germany and France are facing difficulties at the moment, but they have had, through their payback system, uh, a lot more money injected in than we've paid in the health service. We've taken the health service for granted for too long. It's also much too big. I mean, NHS England is the biggest quango in the world. And almost and the biggest employer, yeah. The biggest awful, employer almost, yeah. Completely disastrous reorganisation. And, you know, there we were, we, this chap who they asked to appoint to, to run the bloody thing, um, I mean, he believes in private health care on the health insurance American system. And he's paving the way for that. So actually, I think it would be easier if Britain was to do change, not go for the European system. Uh, but then you have to face very large-scale government involvement in an insurance scheme. I mean, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, mm -hmm. are pretty big sums of money. Oh, huge. So... But they, would it be Look, I'm not against you thinking of different ideas. Models. So it's hard to say when 25% uh, of disapproval system of the NHS at the moment. Um, it's it's a mess. All I ask if, if anybody does anything, test it out first, mm -hmm. trial it, start it in different areas, experiment if you like. Don't make any no more massive top down. Days, yeah. you know. And it does, it does seem, would this be true? Uh, the NHS does appear to be in almost permanent crisis. And again, to go back to Christian Nemitz, who's written for us on this, he tells, he tells a bit, I think it's a little bit of a joke, but only a little bit of a joke. He tells the story that when he came over here from Germany uh, many years ago, he, he realised sort of year after year that there was always a winter crisis mm. in the British National Health Service. And he scratched his head, I don't really remember this ever happening in Germany. But every year, I think on the first year or two, he might have thought, was there a particular cold snap in the United Kingdom? But it became a perennial. Every mm. year there was a winter crisis. And he said, I don't remember this in Germany. So he went back to look at German reports. Like, well, when was the last winter crisis reported as a normal feature of the German healthcare system? And he says, with a slight twinkle in his eye, that the last account that he could find of a German winter crisis in healthcare was 1945, where yeah. indeed Germany did indeed have quite a lot on its plate. Now, crisis is the normal state of British healthcare now. It, it, it permanently, I mean, it never collapses, but it seems to be permanently on the verge of collapse. And if you were to look at survival rates of Brits, I mean, one, you know, one small number for you, if patients suffering from breast cancer, prostate cancer, bowel cancer and lung cancer were treated in the Netherlands rather than the UK, and you applied their survival rates, you know, after mm -hmm. five years, around 9,000 lives a year would be saved in Britain. These are absolutely horrific numbers. Yeah, well, I, I totally understand, and I, I felt the backlash of the BMA when I was Minister of Health. We had a number of strikes, um, most of them ludicrous. But uh, what I also faced was a challenge 
to have item by service payment, which the, sur the surgeons wanted. Well, we stood firm. We had Mr. Grabham, well phrased, to lose with a name like that. Yes, he's mentioned that. But we that had paper. that uh, Lord McCall on that working group, and they defeated that. We've not heard one chip of item by service payments. And I don't think that's going to come in any private or other World Health Organization. I think size is the big thing. Now, the government, I noticed just a few days ago, have given Birmingham and Manchester mayors a great deal more power over their budget. Well done there. Mm -hmm. Decentralization is a key issue. A quango like NHS England is an absurdity. And it's got to end. And we've got to pay it back. But, I mean, ultimately, I mean, I think the mayor of London has proven themselves. And, you know, Livingston wasn't that bad. And um, I don't think the present mayor, is, I think he's doing quite a good job. I know he's a bit more unpopular than some. Boris was a good mayor. And I, I, I can see the health service being run on a London scale at the very least. But this... NHS England has got to come down to smaller accountable units. And, but do it slowly and do it with the experimental changes and things like that. So in my view, start with Manchester. After all, Scotland is a decentralised health service. Mm -hmm. They run it themselves. So does Wales. And so, to a great extent, does Northern Ireland. So it's England that's the problem. Well, I think the, I think the NHS is... Uh, the, the three largest employers on the planet, if I recollect, are the Indian Nationalised Railways, the National Health Service, and the People's Liberation Army of China. These are all sort of a million north. So, and, of course, a, a continual refrain of the SDP was decentralisation yeah. and devolution. Still, the UK, even with, say, Holyrood or the London mm -hmm. Mayor, we're about the most centralised country in the Western world, yeah. if you were to measure who really controls tax okay. revenue and spending yeah. power. Uh, let's look on other changes, which may come in the budget, and I hope they do. That women are an extremely important part now, we all know, of the workforce. And you must go out of your way to make childcare much cheaper and much easier and more available. It's a relatively low-cost investment for a substantial return. And I think that, uh, I mean, uh, Child Property Action Group have produced things. People, various people are producing ideas for the <coughs> Chancellor about five or six reforms. Well, if he does four of them, it would be great. And you will bring them an intelligent, highly uh, motivated. I mean, the woman who decides to both handle children and a job is already an exceptional person. They're, they're balancing all these different things. For goodness sake, don't put the financial disincentives we've got in front of it. But there's also a regulatory failure here, right? We're, the, we're, we're very tightly regulated in the child care industry. I appreciate child safety concerns and the rest of it, but if, if you were to compare us to more informal child care that exists yeah. typically in places like France and Spain, it's obviously cheaper. It's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. absolutely ridiculous. A mother will watch pretty carefully what's going on there, and they'll uh, have other mothers who are not working, and they'll share information at the school gate and everything mm -hmm. like that. There's a pretty alert system for things that are going wrong, and I think you, uh, you, you're absolutely right. It's completely, absurdly overregulated. But where are all at fault of that? Maybe even you. And some accident happens. Somebody burns their hand or anything like that. Immediately an inquiry is set yeah. up. So firstly, that will take three months at the very least, and usually a year and sometimes two. And then they'll come up with legislation, and this parliament must deal with it. And so before you know where you are, one awful incident is met by a regulatory barrage of yeah. stuff. We have got to stop that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it, the first solution, when do you say no? Yep. How do you say no? How do you stop the legislative factory? The House of Commons, of course, is in a disastrous state. It has not recovered from its act of uh, appalling, undemocratic nature when it tried to stop Brexit. I, it will take a long time for it to recover. And those politicians who were involved in that process will always be viewed by many people with great suspicion. Uh, that parliament was a dreadful parliament. 
uh, Theresa May had lost her way because she'd been effectively defeated, she should have resigned. Politicians who lose elections should go. I think it's as simple as that. I think it's very, very exceptional. If you come in with a huge deficit, you can't possibly shift in one parliament, that's fine. You give them more time. Gates Gill was rightly given time after 59. Of course, he would have been a great prime minister if he'd come in in 64. Um, and, and deserved to. He wouldn't have had the narrow majority of Harold Wolfs. And I think that we have got to understand. And I mean, uh, Mr. Cameron, uh, how do you explain going around the country and telling everybody who would follow Harold Wilson in the 1975 referendum that if the, you were backing staying, but if the vote was to leave, you would stay and deal with it. We never once discussed what to do, what mechanism. There was no blueprint on either side. We were waiting for it to be referred. If we won the referendum, it was going to go to Cameron and his government. He's there resigning at 8.15 in the morning. Absolutely, he's promised he wouldn't do it. And people, I hear Tories explaining it away as if he only couldn't have... Well, nobody expected to stay for another two years. But to start the port... The, if he'd been there saying, we are going to now follow the electorate and we'll listen now to everybody, we'll have a plan, and he then set down three months later, it would be, but it, he induced chaos. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this, and uh, I'd like to finish by looking at the future, how riven British politics and the House of Parliament, the House of Commons, was uh, over the Brexit issue. I've even heard some people almost liken it to a, a civil war. I don't like those that terminology because there wasn't an enormous amount of violence, but it absolutely uh, split uh, British public opinion, families, uh, political parties split down the middle. But you strike, Lord Owen, a rather slightly more optimistic note towards the end that you think we're sort of over that period and that there is now a political consensus that Brexit is done mm. and we're not going to continue to fight between Remainers and leavers or rejoiners and leavers. Do you think that's right, that there is now a prevailing consensus around the new constitutional settlement? I think so. Dear Rishi, dear Rishi, <laughs> she did a great job, the European Commissioner in Sunak and mm -hmm. the... Uh, Ursula van der Leyen, you yeah, mean? Yeah. 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 And I think Starmer, I mean, who led the opposition to accepting the referendum result, but Starmer, he's now accepted it. Well, I don't waste time now. Both of them are ready to accept that we're going forward outside the European EU for a lifetime, for a lifetime, generational. It's, and, you know, Henry VIII, when he pulled out of Rome, was a bit rough and ready at times. Uh, I never expected. The fundamental issue is constitutional. It is the fact that David uh, Cameron asked... Merkel, direct to her face, will you allow us to have a clause that we will not be brought into ever closer union? Mm -hmm. and she said no. Mm -hmm. As soon as I saw that, firstly, I was surprised he put it on his list, but he put it on his list. I was not surprised that the answer was no. And from that moment on, this was your only opportunity was to vote Brexit. It's been a frightful mess. It's been dealt with, probably inevitably. You know, I... I used to write to Theresa May with suggestions and I thought they were sensible and could have been agreed, but could they have got through? And I think you know, she did her best. That I, was the I, problem with the House, House of Commons at the time. There was a blocking majority for every single possible proposal. Yes, right? yeah, but, and a speaker who had an agenda and who was allowed to use uh, the procedures of lawmaking for a majority group. Mm -hmm. now, I'm amazed that the Tory party have not stopped that. Mm -hmm. I personally think it was the wrong ruling, but he's the speaker, he made it. And that should be ruled out. And before you go to the country again, you should never be able to do what was done. That was a breach of the, not just the conventions. I believe it was a breach of the whole structure of the House of Commons. And it needs to be struck out and there, I can't understand why that hasn't been done. Anyhow, the next finished? election is an interesting election. It's not one. This is a, a still a can be highly convivable. 
I, I dread to think what would happen with another hung parliament. I wouldn't like to see that, but I probably won't be here to see it anyhow. So I... Why are you so worried about hung parliaments? This was the SDP's key proposition, that a balanced parliament with parties working across party lines could be a Fair stable enough. government for the United Kingdom. Fair you don't need one party rule. You're quite right. And um, I believe if we had one power, we would have been able to introduce such a government. But, you know, a lot happens. I so used to sticking with your views. Every one of the views I have is not the same as what I wrote 40 years ago. I, I, for example, I did think proportional representation could bring better government. I believe that, that is completely nonsense now to, to go on that. Whether the Liberals were wise to go for AV, which is not proportional... Can actually think, be even less proportional yes, than the first exactly. part of the party. That's why be. any sensible person votes against AV. You can't make a change in the voting system and then get an abor aberration as a result. But, you know, that went to a referendum and it was decisively defeated. So don't come back on proportional representation. I don't think we should make any big change. Of course, we should get rid of the House of Lords because it's not only an anachronism, it's an affront. They are legislators. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a legislator unless you are um, elected. And the House of Commons will never elect a second chamber, allow a second chamber to come out. But there are ways in which you can build in I mean, the, again, the German constitution is very worthwhile looking mm. at. I mean, the Bundestag, in which the landers influence a federal government, is very interesting. So I, I think, don't underrate this importance to give more financial freedom to Birmingham and Manchester. It's a small decision, you could say, but it has big openings. So it's sort of pilot devolution, really. Yes, yes. You've done it in London. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think London is a success. I banned the streets and thought that Thatcher was just getting rid of something she didn't like and everything like that. Um, but I think London has surprised us. It certainly surprised me. But I mean, I would like to see Plymouth given more powers. Mm -hmm. I'm, in the end of the day, a Plymouthian. That's why I had a long career in politics. Mm -hmm. They would never, if I hadn't have that link with them... You would have lost your seat. Betty Boothroyd came to the selection conference made a very good speech, I was told afterwards, by the women. I said, well, what, why didn't you vote for her? Oh, well, patience to your father. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So, so my career... was based on your father's uh, medical practice. And I take some satisfaction in the fact that uh, Plymouth voted 60-40 to go out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, it was not easy for me. Everybody in my family wanted to stay. They were immensely tolerant about me. And by and large, most of my friends have been very tolerant about me. I still think it's the right decision. I think it will be still rough a little, but I think it's gradually improving. And I think that uh, European traders are beginning to start to feel, why was we always selling into England? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now they realise that as things and markets are closing and Russia and all these things happening in Germany, Germans will start to want to be selling into Britain mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. And they'll ask the people to make the paperwork a little easier. And it can easily be done. And dear Rishi and her ladyship, she's an able... Back on good terms. Yes, she's good at human relations. She yeah. was no use as a minister. It was thought to be hopeless as right. a defence minister. But she has the touch to get people to talk and to, to deliver. And I think it, 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 it is a significant deal, the, the Belfast block. She mm -hmm. said, I've accepted the democratic structures of um, power sharing mm -hmm. in the Belfast block. And if you're going to try and make a deal, that we all are prisoners of the peace agreement. Mm -hmm. and none of us want to go back. And power sharing, very difficult thing to do for elected politicians. We think it's winning and win it takes all. Lord Owen, let's finish on, I hope, a positive note. We've probably had something like a decade or more of near chaos. We've touched on Brexit, obviously COVID. We've had Donald Trump as president. We've had the Scottish referendum. I'm trying to remember when the last sort of normal year was in British public discourse. But you suggest in the final few sort of paragraphs or page or two of your paper that we, you're, you're clear to say we don't need a national government, but you do say that we need some sort of national 
consensus or conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are calmer waters ahead? We've had a sort of Fritz sort of really agitated, particularly over Brexit, but over a whole range of issues. Is there calmer waters ahead such that we can have an intelligent, balanced political and economic discussion rather than what's often felt at the last 10 years, people just screaming at each other? Yes, and I do so for one deep reason, Ukraine. I think Ukraine showed in credit to Boris, he saw its deep geopolitical significance, and I think that was a very good decision, ably supported by Wallace, but also supported by the Labour Party. I look out at the Ukrainians coming into this country in different parts of the country where I, I live on the route to Plymouth, and I see, again, an amazing response of ordinary people wanting to help. If you come up to the Ukrainians, there's a real deep-seated wish to try and help and to do something. And then I think there is a, a growing sense that um, we do need now a strong defence. And I think it's a very good thing that the government has taken us into uh, the Pacific. If we want the Americans to cross the Atlantic, we've got to be ready to go back into the Pacific. Very it's as simple as that. It's a hard sell, you know, out on the um, uh, cowboy lands of America to understand why the hell they should contribute to European defense. It's a miracle, actually. Truman... I'm bringing the boys home and then six months later saying, I'm afraid they've got to stay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've got to face it. There's a growing group in America that doesn't any longer be feelingly committed to NATO. If they see us becoming committed to the Pacific, they will be but keener to go on paying the bills in NATO. NATO has shown itself to be a fantastic organisation over Ukraine. Amazing. I never believed it could develop that definition of a defensive alliance. So I'm still optimistic, and I'm optimistic for the Britain of my grandchildren, and I see that generation, there's terrific uh, spirit in it. I'm not defeatist or depressed. Well, Lord Owen, thank you for finishing on an optimistic note. Thank you again for writing this Rebuilding Britain paper, which is available for free on the IEA website and linked in the show notes uh, uh, below. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up icon just below the screen. And if you're not yet subscribed to the IEA London YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to make sure that you're kept abreast of all future IEA videos. Lord Owen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you very you much indeed. Thank you for allowing my views to be read by not probably an audience of total support. Uh, I think that's a fair way of putting it, but perhaps this is the sort of consensus or at least national conversation we can have from here on in. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast. 